imagine that we live in an age of reason. And the global warming alarm is dressed up as science, but it's not science, it's propaganda. There's no direct evidence which links 20th century global warming to uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases. We're just being told lies, that's what it comes down to. You can't say that CO2 will drive climate. It certainly never did in the past. If the CO2 increases in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, then the temperature will go up. But the ice core record shows exactly the opposite. So the fundamental assumption, the most fundamental assumption of the whole theory of, of climate change due to humans is, is shown to be wrong. The whole thing stinks. Man-made global warming is no longer just a theory about climate. It is the defining moral and political cause of our age. Campaigners say the time for debate is over. Any criticism, no matter how scientifically rigorous, is illegitimate, even worse, dangerous. But in this film, it will be shown that the Earth's climate is always changing that there is nothing unusual about the current temperature and that the scientific evidence does not support the notion that climate is driven by carbon dioxide, man-made or otherwise. Everywhere you are told that man-made climate change is proved beyond doubt. But you are being told lies. When people say, we well, don't believe in global warming, I say, no, I believe in global warming. I don't believe that, that human CO2 is causing that warming. A few years ago, if you would ask me, I would tell you it's CO2. Why? Because just like everyone else in the public, I uh, listened to what the uh, media had to say. Each day, the news reports grow more fantastically apocalyptic. Politicians no longer dare to express any doubt about climate change. There is such intolerance of any dissenting voice are some of the worst climate criminals on the planet. This is the most politically incorrect thing possible, is to doubt this climate change orthodoxy. Global warming has gone beyond politics. It is a new kind of morality. Now, the Prime Minister is back from his holiday, is unrepentant and unembarrassed about yet another long-haul destination. Yet, as the frenzy over man-made global warming grows shriller, many senior climate scientists say the actual scientific basis for the theory is crumbling. There were periods, for example, in Earth's history when we had three times as much CO2 as we have today, or periods when we had ten times as much CO2 as we have today. And if CO2 has a large effect on climate, then you should see it in the temperature reconstruction. If we look at climate through the geological time frame, we would never suspect CO2 as a major climate driver. None of the major climate changes in the last thousand years can be explained by CO2. We can't say that CO2 will drive climate. It certainly never did in the past. I've often heard it said that there is a consensus of thousands of scientists on the global warming issue and that humans are causing a catastrophic change to the climate system. Well, I am one scientist, and there are many that simply think that is not true. Man-made global warming is no ordinary scientific theory. This morning, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made up of... It is presented in the media as having the stamp of authority of an impressive international organization. From the IPCC, the... The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPCC, like any UN body, is political. The final conclusion are politically driven. This claim that the IPCC is the world's top 1,500 or 2,500 uh, scientists, you look at the bibliographies of the people and it's simply not true. There are quite a number of non-scientists. And to build the number up to 2,500, they have to start taking reviewers and government people and so on, anyone who ever came close to them. And none of them are asked to agree. Many of them disagree. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists. People have decided you have to convince other people 
that since no scientist disagrees, you shouldn't disagree either. Uh, but that, whenever you hear that in science, that's pure propaganda. This is the story of how a theory about climate turned into a political ideology. See, I don't even like to call it the environmental movement anymore because really it is a political activist movement and they have become hugely influential at a global level. It is the story of the distortion of a whole area of science. Climate scientists need there to be a problem in order to get funding. We have a vested interest in creating panic because then money will flow to climate science. There's one thing you shouldn't say and that is, this might not be a problem. It is the story of how a political campaign turned into a bureaucratic bandwagon. Fact of the matter is that tens of thousands of jobs depend upon global warming right now. It's a big business. It's become a great industry in itself. And if the whole global warming farrago collapsed, there'd be an awful lot of people out of jobs and looking for work. This is a story of censorship and intimidation. I have seen and heard their spitting fury at anybody who might disagree with them, which is not the scientific way. It is a story about Westerners invoking the threat of climatic disaster to hinder vital industrial progress in the developing world. One clear thing that emerges from the whole uh, environmental debate is the point that uh, there's, there's somebody keen to kill the African dream, and the African dream is to develop. The environmental movement has evolved into the strongest force there is for preventing development in the developing countries. The global warming story is a cautionary tale of how a media scare became the defining idea of a generation. The whole global warming business has become like a religion. And uh, people who disagree are called heretics. I'm a heretic. Uh, the makers of this program are all heretics. In 2005, a House of Lords inquiry was set up to examine the scientific evidence of man-made global warming. A leading figure in that inquiry was Lord Lawson of Blaby, who, as Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 1980s, was the first politician to commit government money to global warming research. We had a very, very thorough inquiry, took evidence from a whole lot of uh, people expert in this area and produced a report. What surprised me was to discover how weak and uncertain the science was. In fact, there are more and more thoughtful people, some of them a little bit frightened to come out in the open, but who quietly, privately, and some of them publicly, are saying, hang on, wait a minute, this simply doesn't add up. We are told that the Earth's climate is changing. But the Earth's climate is always changing. In Earth's long history, there have been countless periods when it was much warmer and much cooler than it is today, when much of the world was covered by tropical forests or else vast ice sheets. The climate has always changed and changed without any help from us humans. We can trace the present warming trend back at least 200 years to the end of a very cold period in Earth's history. This cold spell is known to climatologists as the Little Ice Age. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. It doesn't show signs of stop. In the 14th century, Europe plunged into the Little Ice Age. And where we would look for evidence of this are the old illustrations and prints and pictures of Old Father Thames. Because during the hardest and toughest winters of that Little Ice Age, the Thames would freeze over. And there were wonderful ice fairs held on the Thames, skating and people actually selling things on the ice. 
If we look back further in time, before the Little Ice Age, we find a balmy golden era when temperatures were higher than they are today, a time known to climatologists as the medieval warm period. It's important that people know that climate enabled a quite different lifestyle in the medieval period. We have this view today that warming is going to have apocalyptic outcomes. In fact, wherever you describe this warm period, it appears to be associated with riches. We're having a heat wave. In Europe, this was the great age of the cathedral builders, a time when, according to Chaucer, vineyards flourished even in the north of England. All over the city of London, there are little memories of the vineyards that grew in the medieval warm period. So this was a wonderfully rich time. And this little church, in a sense, symbolized it, because it comes from a period of great wealth. Going back in time further still, before the medieval warm period, we find more warm spells, including a very prolonged period during the Bronze Age, known to geologists as the Holocene Maximum, when temperatures were significantly higher than they are now for more than three millennia. If we go back 8,000 years in the Holocene period, our current interglacial, it was much warmer than it, was, than it is today. Now the polar bears obviously survived that period, they're with us today, they are very adaptable and these warm periods in the past, what we call hipsy thermals, uh, pose no problem for them. Climate variation in the past is clearly natural. So why do we think it's any different today? In the current alarm about global warming, the culprit is industrial society. Thanks to modern industry, luxuries once enjoyed exclusively by the rich are now available in abundance to ordinary people. Novel technologies have made life easier and richer. Modern transport and communications have made the world seem less foreign and distant. Industrial progress has changed our lives. But has it also changed the climate? According to the theory of man-made global warming, industrial growth should cause the temperature to rise. But does it? Anyone who goes around and says that carbon dioxide is responsible for most of the warming of the 20th century hasn't looked at the basic numbers. Industrial production in the early decades of the 20th century was still in its infancy restricted to only a few countries, handicapped by war and economic depression. After the Second World War, things changed. Consumer goods like refrigerators and washing machines and TVs and cars began to be mass-produced for an international market. Historians call this global explosion of industrial activity the post-war economic boom. So how does the industrial story compare with the temperature record?